So when you look at man, let's look at what he is and does in the real world. Don't give me no Pollyanna views of man. Number four, we should view the evil actions of men as arising from his nature. People do evil things because they are evil. Instead of trying to find some hidden or higher nature that is intrinsically good. Five, man cannot be understood except in the context of his relationship to God. Thus, his relationship to God is not something that is added to man's nature. That is, we're going to talk about man and we'll understand man and then we'll talk about his relationship to God. Man in relationship to God is what man is all about. You cannot separate the two. It is the very core of man's nature. Six, it is impossible to understand man apart from and independent of the Bible. We are not placing man in the light of Scripture. Rather, man cannot be seen except in the light of Scripture because otherwise we're in darkness. Imagine in a dark room and you're blind to boot and you're trying to feel and f what is a man like? And you say, <laughs> if you're in the darkness and you're blind... Are you going to come up with an accurate picture? No. That's what philosophy is, philosophy. It's only in the light of Scripture we understand man qua man. Seven, when man is viewed apart from God and special revelation, he loses all uniqueness and meaning. That's why man is nothing more than an animal to be bred and cloned and harvested for organ parts. Babies are eaten in China. The fetuses from the abortion mills are cooked in soups. It's horrific. Well, you've lost all uniqueness, all meaning. Eight, there is no higher or divine self in man that lies beyond his wicked heart. This is where Arminians, you see, fail to understand. They say, well, I believe that man is a sinner. I said, no, you really don't. You believe there's that little part of man that is really good, 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 good. Oh, I don't. Do you believe man has a good will or a bad will? Well, uh, 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 I believe man's will is good and it's free. He has a free will. I said, is his free will good or bad? Well, uh, 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 it's good. I said, then there's still something good in man? The Bible says you are enslaved, you see. Nine, humanism is based on an abstract and idealized view of man that is naive. You know what naive means? It's totally unrealistic, out of touch with reality. In its optimistic view of the ability of human reason to understand itself and the universe apart from and independent of God's revelation. Humanists assume they don't need the Bible. I encountered some professors in college like that. I took a course, a minored in psychology, majored in philosophy, and this one psychology professor said, what do you have there? I said, I have a Bible. Well, put it away. This is not a Bible study. We're studying the Christian view of psychology. What he meant by the Christian view of psychology was John Dewey, who did the Dewey Decimal System, his pagan humanistic concept of psychology, which he sprinkled and served up as the Christian view. So he didn't want me to bring a Bible because I wanted to check his theories by what? The Word. He was getting them from John Dewey. They'll define man as the rational animal, animas, Rationé and all this other stuff. That's ridiculous. Number 10, Arminianism is based on an a priori abstract and idealized view of man that was derived from Greek philosophy and the Romanticism of the Renaissance. I know that's a lot. We've already gone through that. It simply means Arminian theology begins with the picture of man that is totally unrealistic. It's sanitized. It comes from the Greeks. It's like the statue of David. They think of man as this glorious thing, you say. Eleven, when biblical theists deny that man has a free will, they say, well, he has a will in bondage to sin, you say. It ain't free anymore. Religious and secular humanists are horrified and often react emotionally. Why? They have adopted the a priori. Now, a priori means you've already decided something is true before you sat down at the table to discuss issues. It's your presuppositions, your starting points. Things that you silently think are true, but you've never questioned them. It's like the theory of evolution. When you're dealing with a thoroughgoing humanist and you say, let's debate the issue of evolution, they say, debate the issue? Well, that's a fact. 
Evolution is a fact, and we move on from there. We don't question it. It's an assumption. We, no, you don't. See, they get shocked. Greek philosophy believed that human autonomy, now autonomy, autonomos means self-law. Self-law. The idea that man is capable of producing his own ethical system. And you see, to them, because they have imbibed the bitter waters of the Picatus and Plato and Socrates, free will is so important that if anyone denies it, they shriek, they howl. And isn't it a shame when you hear Christian apologists debating an atheist and the Christian apologist starts out, and I heard this with my own ears, well, given the fact of free will, we can solve the... And the humanist smiles. Why? Because that's their doctrine too. If you begin where the atheist begins, guess where you will end up if you are logically consistent? You'll end up with him. Number 12, defective views of salvation arise from unbiblical views of the nature of God and of man. Well, from that point, we went uh, several weeks into the whole issue of the uh, nature of God. And now we come to the closing discussion of the biblical view of man, part two. And I did it in the form of a catechism, a catechism. Question number one, did God create man or did he evolve from lower life forms? From the goo through the zoo to you. My answer, number one, the days of Genesis 1 are normal 24-hour days. I've dealt with it. I've looked at this question for many, many years. I've debated those who believe each day is an age. I've debated those who say, well, there's no, no days at all are there. Day one means that God came to Moses on day one and said, I created this. And then he came to Moses on day two and said he created this. So the days don't even refer to creation. I've dealt with all kinds of schemes um, that were invented after the evolutionary theory uh, to try to save the Bible. It's a very dangerous business to ride in on your white horse to save God, Christ, and the Bible. They're not damsels who need your rescue. Let the Bible say what it wants to say. Number two, the age of the universe is far younger than claimed. Uh, we have a little pamphlet. Most of you have it. How old is the universe? It's on the table. I was very happy to see a John Ankerberg show where D. James Kennedy had showed up to debate someone and the humanists didn't show up. So they decided, well, what do you want to talk about? And he got a hold of that exact pamphlet that we have on the table, how old is the universe, and went through the scientific evidence that the universe is not billions and billions and billions of years old. There's good evidence for that. Three, the fatal flaws of the various theories. Underline that. There is no monolithic theory of evolution. That's the first myth. There are as many theories as there are evolutionists today because none of them work, so they tend to multiply. Ten things that all of these theories have to deal with. One, um, Murray Aiden at MIT put into the world's greatest computer, time plus chance but matter, and he gave 15 you know, billion years, 20 billion years. Given all the time you want, plus chance, plus matter, what is the probability of coming up with the complexity of the universe we exist today? The answer is zero. Statistically, it doesn't work. You can also read the writings of Polanyi and others. These are the fathers of statistical studies. It is more probable that as you drive uh, into Wales and you see on the long uh, a hillside in white stones, welcome to Wales, it is more probable that that message was by pure chance. That is, the rocks happened to fall out in that configuration and the birds sat appropriately on only those rocks. So in white, it says, welcome to Wales. Polanyi, as a non-Christian, said, it is more probable for that to happen than for evolution to be true. That's why it's the scientists and the mathematicians who are saying evolution simply cannot be true, statistically speaking. Uh, three, everything came from nothing. So I'll take a jar, put a lid on it, and I said, now, I'll put it in my closet. When I come back, I expect to find a million dollars in there. Everything comes from nothing. Nothing comes from nothing, dear. Life from non-life? These are questions you ask. They used to believe in spontaneous generation because they thought that mice were produced spontaneously in rags until a famous scientist put 
rags, take bread, that was the other one. Bread became moldy spontaneously out of nothing. So they put it in a vacuum jar and if you make a vacuum and you have bread in there, guess what? No mold. Order from chaos? Let some two-year-olds loose in a playroom. Now, when they're finished, everything will be neat and everything stacked and it will be orderly. How many of you believe that? The personal from the non-personal? How does a rock develop personality? The personal had to come from the non-personal if evolution is true. Morality from the non-moral? Tree stumps don't have morality. Animals don't. Do Where did morality come from? Well, it came from the non-moral. Well, that's a big leap. Consciousness from non-consciousness? I'm conscious of my existence. Now, how do you go from a rock to me? Well, if evolution is true, they must find some mechanism that allows a rock one day to say, I think, therefore I am. Doesn't work. Beauty and meaning from survival of the fittest? Lord Balfour, Prime Minister of England, did a whole book called Foundations of Belief. It's a rare book. I have a copy of rare book. He argued this way, if evolution were true, there would be no art. There would be no morals. Why? If survival of the fittest is how evolution moves the universe, someone who stopped to smell the roses would have been killed off. Someone who stopped to look at a sunset and got distracted would end up with a spear in his back. Someone who hesitated to kill someone because they were beautiful was not the one to survive. He said beauty, appreciation, should have been bred out of the human race a long time ago. Same for music, art, beauty, meaning, morals. Morals is the greatest hindrance to survival because nice guys finish what? Last. So therefore, it should be no morals at all. Well, you see, the world that exists does not conform to the evolutionary plan. Finally, theories that have no hard evidence whatsoever want to call themselves a fact. These ten things are enough to make you think, and I use it often with young people, and we think through these things. B, how did God create man? Body and soul. Either you are all body and you have no soul. Your soul is your body. You are cartilage and muscle and bone, and when you get burned up, you'll be put in a paint can. And that's all that's left of you. And that is your sum existence of what's in the paint can. Others say you are only your soul, mind, reason. Either you don't have a body, it's an illusion, Hinduism, Zen Buddhism, or your body doesn't matter, as with the Greeks who were horrified at the idea of a bodily resurrection. But you see, you don't have to go the way of materialism and to say you are nothing more than the sum total of your chemical composition. Neither do you have to say you're only spirit, you're only mind. The Bible says you are composed of matter and mind, body and soul. This is under attack. I mean, when I was in seminary, I mean, Westminster Seminary um, has, has its ups and downs, but it did have one Professor Shepherd who was finally thrown out for heresy. And I knew he was a heretic when I sat under him. He said, what is man? Anyone who talks about man being composed of a body and a soul that is separate from his body, as if his soul or his mind existed apart from and independent of, is foolish. You are your body. So I raised my hand. And you say, I always got into trouble. How many of you think I got into the trouble in the next minute when I opened my mouth? I said, poor Jesus. And everybody whipped around. Poor Jesus, I said, yes, he was a fool, wasn't he? He said, do not be afraid of those who can kill your body, but cannot what? Kill the soul. I said, poor Jesus. Poor, and poor Paul. He said, while the outward man is decaying, the inward man is getting stronger. The outward man is your what? Your body. The inward man is what? Your soul. Same thing as the Apostle John. I gave you several verses. Matthew 10, 28. 
the body and the soul are not the same thing because to kill the body would be to kill the soul. To kill the soul would be to kill the body. Jesus made a distinction between the two. 2 Corinthians 4.16, the distinction between the inner man and the outer man. And no, that isn't the little child within. Forget that nutcase. 3 John verse 2, I wish your body was as healthy as your soul. If your soul is your body, if your body has the flu, guess what your soul has? The flu. He's saying the soul was healthy, but the body was sick. You see, don't be ashamed of believing that you are composed of a body and a soul. Don't, don't worry about all these people who deny it, even within the evangelical church today. You are both, and that's the way God constituted you. Three, in what sense is man created in the image of God? You're going to have to listen to me carefully here. Let the gray cells vibrate in the cranium. Special revelation is the only basis for understanding what the image of God means. He said, well, why did you say that? Because nobody follows it today. I have been to theological conferences. What is the image of God within man? Nobody bothered to bring a Bible. Well, where are they getting their information about the image of God? Well, you see, they go to philosophy. Let us study what Epictetus had to say. Well, we're going to study what we find in the dialogues of Plato. Here we have Thrasymachus debating. Or they talk to the psychologists and the psychiatrists who will tell you what man is. One can think, Professor uh, up at a seminary not far from here wrote the book, The Christian on the Couch. Tweedy is his name. He stated the Christian view of man is found in the writings of William Frankel and his system called logotherapy. Well, who was William Frankel? An atheistic Jew who survived the concentration camps, who had some anger against God and wrote about the nature of man. Now, do you think an atheistic Jew who had an axe to grind is giving you the Christian view of man? That's what it says, the Christian on the couch, you say. Well, you don't go to philosophy or psychology. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 8. I'm going to revamp this by applying it to contemporary issues. Now, originally, Isaiah was applying it to the psychic hotline uh, that was very popular in his day. Everybody was using astrologers and psychics. Even the king was. And that's why they killed old Isaiah. He was an irritant. He kept telling them, you should not listen to the astrologers the psychics, the witches, the soothsayers, they're wrong. They were telling the king, you have nothing to worry about. Babylon will never attack you. And Isaiah said, He's, Babylon's coming and God's going to break this country up. So, you know, in the end, they put him in a hollowed out log and they had two men start sawing and he met his end by literally being torn in half by the teeth of this huge saw. Thus, church history records he was sawed in half and then, of course, they've done it to his book ever since. But if you look in Isaiah 8, verse 19, when they say to you, consult the philosophers and the shrinks who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God instead? Should they consult dead philosophers on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light whatsoever, and particularly the light of the dawn. The brightest moment is when the sun comes up. They tell me, since I'm not someone who's ever sailed, that if you're out in a sailboat and it's nothing but water, that when the sun comes up, it just is like brilliant, just beyond belief. And here he's saying, listen, if they don't go by the scriptures, they're in darkness. Total, total darkness. So ignore what the philosophers have to say, natural theology and all of that nonsense. Well, that means silly answers. Silly answers. Yes, some of these are so silly because they have no ground in Scripture. Not a single verse, a half of a verse, not even a half of a verse. They have those philosophers, and they're so-called Christians, who said man is in the image of God because he's bipedal. 
and he stands on his two feet. Therefore, he's in the image of God. You said, really? Yes, they've said that. Man is in the image of God because man has a free will. You'll hear this. There's not even a half of a verse that would teach this. Oh, man's reason is how he's in the image of God. No, his capacity to reason is not the hallmark of the image of God because that capacity is shared in various degrees even by other life forms on the planet. Take my Bichon Frise. Now this dog, I wanted to check his intelligence because they say the Bichon is one of the most intelligent little dogs. So we're in the kitchen and we have kitchen gates because we've already learned if he's in the kitchen and you're not there, he's in the garbage, he's here, he's there. So he's in there and I have a little treat for him this gate is open, but the other door is not open. It has a gate, and I take it. Do you want the treat? <laughs> he dances. You make him dance and do his little circus act. Then I threw it over the gate into the dining room. So he ran to the gate, and he could see the treat, but he knew he couldn't get to it. And I sat there and watched, and like a flash, he turned around, went out, went all over the house, and came and ate it. Problem-solving ability. Now he's so smart, he comes to the side where the gate is in the dining room, <laughs> knowing I might throw it there. <laughs> but see, man's reason is not how he's in the image of God. Some people say man's personality. Animals have personalities. How many of you ever met up with a mean dog? <laughs> Got them mean. How ever met with a slob, just a happy-go-lucky dog? Friendly, sweet, some cats are nice, some cats... Well, that's why there are harps in heaven, you know, for strings. <laughs> Man's personality. Some people say, and including Bart, B-A-R-T-H, the great liberal neo-orthodox theologian, and then uh, my old schoolmate, Greg Bonson, also taught this next point, that the image of God is the male-female sexual relationship. He said, what? Oh, yeah, doesn't Genesis 1 say... God created man in his own image and his likeness. In the image of God, he created a male and female, created he then. There are those then who seize upon this to say, what constitutes the image of God is a man and a woman in a sexual relationship. Now, Bonson wrote a book against the homosexuals in which he said, a gay person is not in the image of God because they're not involved in a sexual relationship with a woman. You can't have woman-woman, and you can't have man-man. It has to be male-female, full sexual relationship. Then you are really in the image of God. Now, when I read this book when it first came out, they gave me a review copy. I immediately thought, poor Jesus. Poor Jesus. Never had a single woman his whole life. Therefore, he wasn't in the image of God. Poor Adam when he was first created. Was woman there? No, no one to nag him, no one to do anything, see? Was he in the image of God before she was created? I, I, 1 Corinthians 11 said he was. Well, then how could the image of God consist of a heterosexual male-female liaison? What about your children? Well, they're not in the image of God till they get married. Well, what if they never get married? They're not. A, you see how stupid people can be? I thought that was a stupid book. Thankfully, it's out of print. It was stupid. Bart was stupid. Some people say it's the immortality of the soul. There's no scripture for that. Another one that I find in fundamentalist, Schofield, caring Christian circles is, well, God is a trinity, therefore man is what? A trinity. How many of you have heard that one? Yeah, well, that's, you won't find that in the Bible. That's a nifty thing, but you won't find it. It's not true. Lastly, God has a male body, and that's the Mormons. And also, the faith preachers, uh, Dake and them, they say, well, man was created, that is, Adam was created with a male body, complete anatomy, because God the Father is, has a male body, complete anatomy. So the image and likeness is a physical bodily image. There are people who believe that. Believe it or not. Now, what is the uh, Reformed answer? Well, number one, if you're going to discuss the nature of, of the image of God, the first thing you do is what? Open a Bible. Now, I know this is shocking for Southern California. Most people do not even bring a Bible. If you brought your Bible tonight, please lift it up. 
Lift it high. Now, this is a new precedent set in Southern California, all right? Brand new precedent. If you want to know what a phrase or a word in the Bible means, find out where it's found in the Bible. Does that seem obvious? Yet, no one seems to do it. Let's review quickly where it's found. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image and the image of God he created them male and female he created them and God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule, take dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the planet. Chapter 9 and verse 6 is the next reference to the image of God. If you remember, this has to do with the noetic covenant. And this institutes capital punishment. I do like to get involved in the secular media when they say, well, Jesus wouldn't believe in... Uh, capital punishment, the Bible is against it, and I call up as Bishop Morey. I said, I'm Bishop Morey. Oh, Bishop Morey. I said, that's right, you are dead wrong. Jesus would have himself turned the lever. He'd push the button. He believed in capital punishment. That's how he saved us. Go back to Genesis 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God... He made man. Notice the word likeness, likeness is not repeated. Hebraists and other grammarians have pointed out that when we read in Genesis 1, in the image and in the likeness of God, the word likeness is a synonym. It is not two, a different thing. He is in the image and in the likeness. That's why likeness is dropped. It is just parallelism in the Hebrew. It means nothing more. It's nothing distinct. Man in the image of God, and image is the same thing as likeness when you study the passage. Now, believe it or not, you have to go to the New Testament, to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 7, for the very next reference to the image of God. You say, what? No more in the Pentateuch? Nope. What about the historical record? Nope. What about the Psalms? Nope. The prophets? Nope. What about those teeny weeny minor prophets? No. What about the Gospels? No. Have to go to 1 Corinthians 11. And in its context, it's dealing with the controversy of head coverings and women and preaching and speaking in church in the light of the culture of that day. So here it's a side reference. I don't have the time, but ultimately I want to do a book in which I will fill in the, the gap by giving you the Talmudic Jewish development of the concept of the image of God, which is very important to the New Testament concept. But we'll pick up the New Testament here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Uh, for the context, verse 6, if a woman does not cover her head, that is while she's publicly... Verse 5, every woman who has her head uncovered while praying, that's public prayer, or public prophesying, that's speaking, teaching. Anyone says, can women speak in a church? I said, well, Paul evidently had it in his church, had it at Corinth. They were not usurping the authority of the elders of the church, they were speaking under the authority of the church. So those churches like the Reformed Baptists that have the women go to the basement during the prayer meeting because they don't believe that a woman could possibly pray in the presence of men. No, they were praying, they were prophesying. Now, in that culture, if you did so without putting something on your head, this was a disgrace. Matter of fact, you'd be looked like a whore. Verse 6, for if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. Now, this is called the comedic return. Paul was a Jewish comedian. He's using sarcasm. Christian Gentiles, listen up. The Jews have always been comedians. You're missing the Bible if you don't see the jokes of Jesus, the jokes of Paul. 
And here he's, he's using his sarcasm. It's like later he says, well, I speak in tongues more than all of you put together. That's dripping, you see. Here he says, go ahead, let her cut off her head. It's a disgrace. Go ahead, just cut up. Go ahead, go ahead, be a whore. Go all the way. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is what? In the image and, now does he say likeness? He adds a word. Dosa. He is the image and the glory of God that is the apex of the glory of creation is found in the creation of mankind not in dolphins despite the tree huggers dolphins are not that smart if they were why don't they simply avoid the net or swim over the nets why are they in the nets Man is in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory. Notice he doesn't say image. Thank God. The woman is the glory of man. Your wife, men, should be your glory. That's why every man wants his woman to look sharp, talk sharp, walk sharp. That's why men are fools. They're willing to buy her a hundred pair of shoes when she doesn't need them. And she'll say, I need $60 to get my hair done. $60? I go down to Jose. He does mine for three. <laughs> well, the glory of a man is his woman. He's going to spend thousands on her. Well, that's what it says. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. Verse 3, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they should not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And you know who he is? Who is the what? Image of God. So forget male-female sexual relationships. He is the quintessence, the essence of the image of God. He who sees me sees the Father. There's a whole development of the Christological focus of the image of God and Pauline thought we don't have time. Ephesians 4 and verse 24. This is where the Puritans got their definition is found in the Westminster Confession and Larger and Shorter Catechism. Verse 23, you should be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. Don't live according to the old self. Live according to the new self. What is this new self? Which is, is in the likeness or image of God and has been created, there's the word created, in righteousness, and holiness of the truth. Salvation has as its goal to return ma man back to being in the image of God, fully. Righteousness was part of the original image of God and it's something we get back. True holiness was part of the image of God and we get that back through Christ. We'll look at what those things mean in a moment. Turn over to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Again, a Christological reference. Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, Christ himself. Chapter 3 and verse 10 gives us another Puritan passage. Verse 9, do not lie one to another since you've laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to true knowledge according to the what? The image of the one who created him. And lastly, the book of James chapter 3 and verse 9, the half-brother of Jesus, natural son of Joseph and Mary, spoke about a contradiction where people, verse 9, bless with their mouths 
the Lord and the Father, and at the same time, with the same tongue, they curse men. Now, underline the next phrase. This is what is called the Waterloo of the Lutherans. Because the Lutherans historically did not believe that the image of God survived the fall. Men are like beasts. The Calvin and others said, no. Though marred and degraded, you can still find some reflection of the image of God within man. Proof is James 3 and verse 9. You curse men. It does not say believers. So it's talking about man qua man who have been made in the what? Likeness of God or image of God. So people are still in the image of God in some sense because when you curse people, you are cursing those who are created in the image of God. These are the only texts you have in the entire Bible on the issue of the image of God. Now quickly, what can be gleaned exegetically from those passages? Well, in Genesis 1, 28, if you remember, so God created man in his image and made him the ruler over the creatures. And he said, take dominion over the fish. So the image has a functional sense of dominion over the planet. Man stands over the earth. And this is why in Psalm 8, if you turn to Psalm 8, you find an echo of this, as our Dutch theologian Ritterboss has pointed out. Verse 4, what is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that you should care for him? Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God, and you've crowned him with glory and majesty, and you have made him a ha. What does it say in your Bible? To rule over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. The functional meaning of the image of God is that we have been able to domesticate animals and we have been able to manipulate the environment to conform according to our needs. We are the sovereigns of this planet. If there is a river in the way, we divert it. We dam it up. If there's a mountain in the way, we blow it up. We have been able to take dominion over the planet and have sovereignty with the small s and that is a part of the image-reflecting capacity of man. God is sovereign over the entire universe. We are mini-sovereigns, like mini-me. So this is mini-sovereigns, you see. Here's the point. Number two, the image, that's an inside joke for only those who have contemporary tastes in, in theater. The image uh, has a relational sense in that in the context of Genesis 1 through 3, man has a relationship to God. The image of God within man means that man has the capacity to commune with his creator. Rocks do not respond to God, you see. The chickens do not dance in joy. Also, we have the capacity to, to relate to other human beings. That's where Eve and other people came into the thing. And also, uh, to the rest of creation, to the world, we have the ability to sustain relationships. This is an aspect of the image of God because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have an eternal what? Relationship. Thirdly, the image has a unique sense of man being distinct from the rest of the creation. Man stands apart from the world, that is nature, as well as above it. The biggest ripoff of the wacko environmentalists, beside giving us blackouts and grayouts, is that they have thoroughly indoctrinated the people in this country to think that man is only a part of nature. And if he has been submerged into the wax of nature, then he is no more important than eagles or porpoises or pigs. As a matter of fact, they are more important than he is. The biblical view is that man stands apart from and over nature. We are not part of the cosmic machine. We are not clogs in the machinery. We are not part of nature. We are in the image of God. So we have a stewardship over nature. 
and it is our responsibility not to pollute and to destroy it. See, they have no biblical basis for environmentalism. The, only the Christian has a theoretical basis for environmentalism. It has to do with man's uniqueness. He's not an animal. He's not a clog. He's not a clump. Fourth, the image has a noetic sense in that man was created with true knowledge. Isn't that what it said? We read in Colossians 3.10. He was created with true knowledge. When Adam came forth from the Creator, he knew who he was, who God... He had not innate. He knew. I believed he could... I personally believe he could write. He could read. He could communicate. When he met Eve, it wasn't... <coughs> and she went... <coughs> Forget it. From the very beginning, he had innate knowledge of language innate knowledge that God informed them. So that's true knowledge. Five, the image has a positional sense of righteousness. Remember Ephesians 4 says, recreated in righteousness. Righteousness is a forensic or legal term that refers to how, how God views you. Has nothing to do with what you're like. It's God viewed Adam as being right according to the law. Remember, we, we saw before the word righteousness comes from the word for a carpenter's plumb. You have the string and a weight, and you put it up to a wall, and you could tell if the wall was straight. The law of God is the plumb which judges our character, and that's how we know we're all crooked. And we're all crooks, just in various degrees. Say amen, somebody. Amen. It also has an ethical sense of true holiness. Again, Ephesians 4, 24, it says righteousness, what is man as he came forth from the hand of the Creator was viewed as righteous. He was also had, had true holiness as he came forth from the hand. He was not neutral. See, this is where the Arminian, the middle knowledge people, the Processians and other people say, man was created neutral, neither righteous nor vicious. No. The Apostle Paul, he said he was created with true knowledge, in righteousness and with true holiness. So salvation brings us back to what? True knowledge, righteousness and holiness. What happened to the image of God at the fall? Well, man lost his innate knowledge of God, his innate knowledge of himself and the world and all the relationships involved, and now practices idolatry, false teaching, and wickedness. That's why some people view themselves as animals. And they view you as nothing more than an animal. How can you explain what happened at Auschwitz and, and Dachau and Buchenhau where they skinned men who had tattoos and made wallets and lampshades and pocketbooks? They used the hair of women to make cloth. They ground up the bones for fertile. There was nothing left of the Jews. Nothing. They even took the gold out of the teeth. Scripture tells us in Romans 3, 10 through 18, how many people understand God? No one. How many seek after God, says Paul? Nobody. How many people are righteous? Nobody. How many people do good works? No one. Who fears God? No one. It was a total total ethical revolution. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, the natural man cannot understand the things of God. Two, although corrupted, polluted, and enslaved to sin, the image-bearing capacity remains within man, and that's why James 3 verse 9 becomes the cause de celebre of Reformed theology. Walter Martin put it like this one time. I was discussing the image of God. He says, well, I view it this way. You go up in an attic and you find an old mirror I mean really old, where most of the silver backing has flaked away. Now some of you young people don't know how mirrors are made. A mirror is just a piece of glass just like you look through your window in the dining room. But when you put silver on the back, the silver reflects your image. Now this old mirror, most of the silver was gone. When you looked at the old mirror, you only saw reflected here and there a little bit of your image. When God looks at man today, all he sees is a little bit of the flakes here and there. So when Auntie M bakes sugar cookies, that's a little piece of the silver left on the glass. Original sin means that man is conceived in iniquity and born in sin in the sense that he is now unrighteous in his position and he is now unholy in his condition. That's why we need salvation. 
In closing, what are the four states of the Christian? The fourfold state of man, according to Thomas Boston, the famous Puritan. Number one, before the fall, we had perfect freedom to obey God. Nothing hindered us. Our wills were not affected by sin. Our minds were not dulled by the God of this world. Adam and Eve were completely free to obey and to love and adore their Creator. After the fall, no freedom whatsoever. None. Zip. It was gone. After regeneration, growing freedom. You strangely find he breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free. And God surprises you by delivering you from the most wicked things. And he can do it in a flash or through a process. The eternal state is perfected freedom. Notice the difference between perfect and perfected. The Greeks believed that perfection implied immutability. This is not taught in the Bible. Adam was created perfect, but with the ability to move on to becoming evil. If I take a perfect rose, a perfect rose in all respect, no spots, no, it smells, it's beautiful, and I give it to my wife and she puts it in a vase, in a week, what will happen to the rose? Just because it's perfect doesn't mean it will stay that way. Just because man was perfect did not mean he would stay that way. So when humanists say, well, if Adam and Eve were created perfect, how didn't they sin? <laughs> That's because they're assuming, stupidly, that immutability is part of perfection. Once you clear that up, there is no question. At the resurrection, we will be made like Jesus Christ, incapable of ever sinning again. So we will have perfected freedom. We will be free for all of eternity to praise and worship our Creator, to fellowship with each other. There will be no sin. There will be no death, no tears, and no pain for the former things that passed away. If you take the perfect rose, put it in a plastic box and pour liquid plastic and make a paperweight of it, and out it comes when it finally cools, and it's a block, and inside is the perfect rose encased in plastic. If you come back 10 years later, what does the rose look like? As perfect as the day you put it in that plastic because there's no oxygen, no organisms for it to rot. We will be perfected. So the fourfold state, perfect freedom, no freedom, growing freedom, perfected freedom by the grace of God.